So yes, today I'm going to be talking about recurrent linear transformers. And this was the approach that I came up with during my master's. Uh, so just to give you a rough outline of how this talk will go about, uh, we're going to start by discussing why we need transformers for reinforcement learning. And then we are going to venture into uh, the exist why existing approaches wouldn't work. Uh, part of the reason is they are computationally expensive. And then uh, we're going to talk about linear transformers. So this was an approach which wasn't really tested in reinforcement learning, but it's an alternative to the standard transformer architecture. We're going to talk about it because it's going to be the base of the work that we're going to build upon. Uh, and then we're going to discuss two approaches. Uh, the first approach is called the recurrent linear transformer. I'm not going to go into the details of what I'm doing in these two approaches. But the first approach introduces two contributions, uh, which help it to learn in the RL setting. The first contribution is around a gating mechanism. And the second is around the kind of feature map that you should use. And the second approach, called the approximate recurrent linear transformer, improves upon the computation complexity of the first approach. So we're going to start by introducing the reinforcement learning setting. Uh, because uh, so in the reinforcement learning setting, I, uh, we have an agent and we have an environment. And what happens is the agent interacts with the environment through actions. And by uh, doing so, it receives a new state and a reward. Uh, and the goal in reinforcement learning is to then learn a policy. Uh, what is policy? Policy is defined as mapping from states to uh, actions. Uh, but often, in reinforcement learning, the world isn't fully observable. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, instead of seeing the entire true state of the world, uh, the agent will receive an observation. And this observation will only tell very little about the entire state of the world. And this example is common in many real life scenarios, uh, real, uh, real life reinforcement learning scenarios. Let's say there's an agent that's trying to learn to drive a car. All that the agent receives is the pixel observations from the camera. So it has no idea about anything other than the pixel observation it's seeing at the moment. Or let's say an agent in a 3D game trying to navigate around, or maybe in a small 2D maze, even a simpler setting, like grid world setting, but it can only see like a small region around it not the entirety of the maze. So the problem uh, of uh, agents, uh, so then uh, to deal with this kind of a scenario, what we have in reinforcement learning is called uh, agent uh, st state construction. And the idea is that instead of using, uh, because we don't really have an underlying state uh, available, what we do is we use the entire history of the observations that we have so far, uh, seen so far and condition uh, the policy on this history instead of uh, just the current observation. But what is going to happen with this approach is it's going to become expensive because the history is going to grow arbitrarily large as in when the agent keeps on interacting with the world. So instead, what the agent can do is it can maintain some sort of an approximate state. Let's call this S tilde T minus one. This approximate state is going to be a fixed dimensional representation. And what we're going to do is, as in when new data is arriving, we're going to use some state update function U, and we're going to use this function to keep on updating. So every time a new data comes in, we're going to update the previous state to a new state. And then we are going to use this proximate state instead to learn a policy. So what are the possible ways we can implement the state update function? Well, we have recurrent neural networks. And recurrent neural networks fit in this framework really well. The way recurrent neural networks work is it has something called a hidden state. And as and when you get a new input, you can use the input to update to a new hidden state. And so it looks something like this. You have a new observation coming in. Uh, let's call this observation OT. And then maybe it gets encoded in some other form. And finally, you get something called an XT, which is like the encoded representation. And then you can use an RNN to update it. And this kind of a framework is very common. People have used RNNs in actor critic algorithms. Uh, and the idea is that as and when the observations come in, you pass it through some representation learning layer. Let's say it's an image. You want to convert it to a fixed dimension vector. And, as, uh, and then you pass it sequentially to an RNN. And the output of the RNN then gets feeded to an actor and a critic to generate predictions. But then in 2017, there was this paper called Attention is All You Need. And suddenly, everyone is just doing transformers. So yes, and what? So the cool thing was like there was this one architecture called transformers. And there was just one mechanism called self-attention that caused this entire boom. Like there's suddenly everyone is like, okay, no, let's not use RNNs anymore. Now we have transformers. They will work better. And what was the, the main reason for the success behind this approach was uh, 
the kind of the structure that they followed. So a self-attention layer in the transformers uh, so would consist of, so you would have multiple layers in a transformer. And in each of these layer, uh, you are going to have something called the self-attention uh, block. And this is going to be repeated uh, multiple times. So in each of the layer, you're going to have multiple of these self-attention layers. Uh, and then you're going to have multiple layers uh, as well. And the idea behind the self-attention layer is to uh, be able to calculate the relationships about the past in a parallel fashion. But then why don't we see transformers that often in reinforcement learning? And the reason is, for the reinforcement learning spe setting specifically, they are computationally expensive. And this has to do with the way they process data. So when we think about an RNN, an RNN processes data sequentially. So an input comes, and then another input comes. We're going to apply the RNN again one uh, uh, on the input, one after the other, to get uh, representations for each and every time step. But for transformers, the way they were designed from the start is we assume that the data is available. The input stream is available. So the entire input sequence gets passed as a batch to the transformer, and then you have an output. So yeah, this is the problem. In supervised learning, the data is available offline. In supervised learning, we don't really learn sequentially. We have a data set. We have the sequences available offline. So we can apply the entire input sequence. We can pass it through a transformer, use GPUs, uh, and leverage lo a lot of the parallelism that we can get uh, by having an offline sequence. But in reinforcement learning, that's not the case. Because in reinforcement learning, you don't have the observations available. The only way you can get the observations is by interacting with the environment. And the only way you do that is by taking an action in the environment. So the da data has to be processed sequentially. And the input sequence could only process, you only have data until the current time step. So you can't look into the future. You have to interact with the environment. Then only you can uh, do things. So. Why do we even care about this? Like, why do we even want to use transformers in reinforcement learning? And there is reason to believe why this might be interesting. Because uh, in the supervised learning setting, we are constantly seeing so many applications where we are seeing that, yes, transformers are working really well in settings where you require a long context. For example, ChatGPT is a really good example. And there are results to indicate this in the language modeling literature that you know, as and when uh, you increase the number of the context, that is how far back you allow a transformer to look. You see that the uh, performance of these approaches really increases. Like They are able to handle longer context really well. On the other hand, even in simple reinforcement learning problems, like the graph I have here on the right, is for a very simple reinforcement learning problem where you need to remember something just from 50 time steps back. And even in this simple setting, RNNs fail. They, they'll just start, uh, like, stop remembering anything beyond like few uh, number of time steps. And it's also interesting that self-attention is paralyzable. Like I speak, I spoke that, uh, yes, uh, RNNs can process data sequentially and transformers uh, offer the parallelism. But yeah, trans uh, in reinforcement learning, we want to do things sequentially. But let's say we are using, uh, we have a batch of data available, like let's say in an algorithm like PPO. We kind of want to leverage parallelism. So it has the added benefits. So it would be nice to have an algorithm which could be used sequentially and maybe also be parallelized. And that's basically our goal going to be eventually. So we want to make transformers efficient for reinforcement learning. And the question, specific question that we want to ask is, how do we efficiently process the sequential data with self-attention? How can we make, because the core thing that, because of which transform works is self-attention, so can we make some changes to the self-attention layer such that the processing is more computationally efficient? So before we start, I'm going to give you some brief background about self-attention, how self-attention mechanism works. And the idea behind self-attention mechanism is, uh, so the input to a self-attention mechanism is a batch of vectors. So over here, I am denoting that by capital X. And I'm saying that it's n cross t, n being the sequence length, the size of the sequence, and d being some embedding dimensionality. And, what, uh, and then what happens is the output is also uh, a matrix of the same size. And uh, this, let's call that capital A. And what happens then inside the self-attention layer is you're going to generate something called the key query and values. I'm not going to explain in detail why exactly we are doing this. But the idea is this, that you have a batch of data, and everything that you're doing is operating on this batch of data. You're not really processing things uh, one at a time. So you use the entire batch to generate the key query and values. And then you do this some magic operation called softmax. What is this doing? It's basically saying 
trying to capture like a relationship of every element in the batch with every other element in the batch. Briefly, that's what it's doing. But the problem is it's doing everything with a batch of data, not with one sample at a time. Yes. Right. The the product of this two things. Yeah. Uh, the question was: Is the Q uh, T the one which is trying to capture the relationship uh, about the past? And uh, so it's the product of the Q and the K transpose times softmax which is capturing this relationship. Uh, not not just the Q because the Q is like uh, the query that you use to refer to some information in the past. Okay, uh, so we looked at how uh, this thing was applied to a batch of data, but let's say this same algorithm, we want to extend it to uh, a streaming case, like where you have input coming in one at a time. How would that go about? So uh, there is an approach like this called the gated transformer Excel. And uh, the way it works is now, uh, it's, we're gonna do something very simple. So when you have a new, uh, we're gonna maintain the history of the previous inputs. So instead of, maintaining the entire matrix. Let's say we just, data is coming in sequentially. You're gonna maintain the history of the past M inputs, let's say. And then you have the current input at time step T. And what we do is we concatenate it so that it becomes a matrix. So you concatenate the past M inputs, it becomes a matrix, and then you do the same things. You apply, you generate the queries, keys, values, and then you calculate attention. So I guess this is a, kind of an approach which could be applied sequentially to a reinforcement learning setting. But let's think about why this could become computationally expensive. So the challenge is the specific approach that I showed in the previous slides, that's going to have a theoretical context length of m times l. So it's defined by two things, m. m is the number of past history that you, amount of past history you're storing. So if you store, let's say 10, then m, m would be 10. So you just store the past 10 inputs. And l is the number of layers on the transformer. So the context, that is how far back this approach can look back, depends on two things. The amount of history that you are storing and the number of layers you have in the transformer. This is kind of the reason why we see a limit in uh, chat GPT and these kind of things. It's, we say, it says like, you know, like you can process only 4,000 tokens. This is the key reason why this happens because the computational cost increases every time you want to increase, uh, you know, like the amount of context. And the computational complexity also depends on m, uh, uh, the number of history that you, amount of history that you're storing. So every time you increase the amount of history that you want to store, you're going to increase the computational cost. So let's see how this would maybe work in a simple reinforcement learning setting. Let's try a very simple reinforcement learning setting and see how GTR Excel, get a transform Excel approach is going to perform. Uh, so we're going to come, uh, use this environment called TMAZE. And the idea behind this environment is very simple. So the agent here, denoted by this robot, blue robot, it's at the bottom of a T-shaped maze. And uh, at the start of the, uh, uh, at the start of an episode, the agent observes a binary Q signal. This Q signal could be either zero, one or one zero, right? And this Q signal is going to decide which direction uh, at the end of the tunnel there will be a reward or there will be like a penalty. So I'm denoting the reward here by an apple and the penalty is by like a skull. So uh, now the task for the agent is, it has to remember the Q signal that it saw initially at the start of the episode because this Q signal will only be shown only at the start of the episode and it wouldn't be shown after that. So the agent's observation, uh, yes, I guess I explained all this. Yes, so the agent has to take a turn at the end of the tunnel when it has to remember, recall the Q signal that it saw initially. And the agent's observation is going to look something like this. It's going to be 18 bit. And uh, we're going to use, let's say the first two bits to encode the Q signal at the start of the episode. So it's going to be zero one or one zero at the start of the episode. And every step after that, it's going to be zero. So the agent only observes it at the start of the episode and it has to recall that. And then we're going to have the next uh, eight bits uh, as the agent's location. So I want to make everything about this environment fully observable, uh, except the initial Q signal that the agent sees. 
And then we're also going to add some noisy distracted bits. This is just so that, you know, like making the problem a little bit complicated. Um, you, these bits are going to be initialized at random at every time step. Uh, sorry, they're going to be generated at random at every time step. And there are four actions the agent can take, left, right, up, and down. And we're going to use the advantage actor critic algorithm. Uh, for people who don't know this, this is a policy gradient algorithm, uh, which you can use in a reinforcement learning setting. And it, you, you can use a neural network VS function approximator uh, in this uh, specific uh, algorithm. And we're going to use the transformer, GT, the gated transformer Excel algorithm as the uh, neural network function approximator uh, for, for this algorithm. And we're going to train each agent for 10, 10 million time steps. And we're going to report the mean success rate, the, uh, the number of times the agent takes the current uh, correct turn in the last 100k time steps. Right. And so if you think about it, a memoryless agent, a agent which does not remember the initial queue signal, has a 50, uh, if it takes random action at the intersection, it has a 50% chance of taking the correct turn. So the baseline score could be around 50. And then the best score that you could get is 100. So we'll vary the corridor length. So the corridor length is the gap between when you see the queue signal and the length of the, you know, like how much you have to travel. So uh, our hypothesis is that, the, you know, like the longer you have to remember it, the more difficult it's going to get and more computationally expensive it's going to get. And we're going to train two architectures. So I said like the, for Transform Excel, the computational complexity depends on two things. The computational complexity and the context depends on two things. The amount of history that you're storing and the number of layers you are having. So we're going to fix the number of layers. Let's say we just use four layers. And we're going to train two approaches. One with, uh, because we have, we have the largest possible corridor length is 200. We're going to train one approach with memory size 256. So it has access to the last 256 times, which means for the longest corridor length also, it has the entire episode as uh, input. Uh, another one we are going to train with memory size 128. So this one would have a smaller context uh, than the entire episode. But theoretically, because it depends on the number of layers and the amount of history, it should also work. Because the theoretically, it should, have, it should be able to remember 512 time steps. But let's see how this would perform in practice. And our hypothesis is that uh, the first approach, which has the entire history uh, of entire episode as input, would work, and the other one would not. But the, this problem is not there with RNNs, right? Because we said that RNNs process data sequentially. And uh, the technical term for this is they offer a context-independent inference cost, which means increasing the context is not going to increase the computational cost. So, Let's think about this. Can we have a recurrent neural network, which is a replacement for self-attention? And so in 2020, there was this paper called Transformers are RNN. And what they tried to show is, they tried to show that there is a theoretical equivalent of self-attention. Like you can come up with a theoretical equivalent of self-attention, which would theoretically do the same thing, but maybe it would offer uh, work slightly less. It would have slightly uh, less performance, but it's going to be theoretically equivalent uh, to RNNs. And the idea uh, was called linear self-attention. So it was an approximate version of self-attention. And it was a recurrent neural network. It was no longer a transformer. And the way uh, they did it is, so they said, instead of using a softmax, so the softmax is a similarity function, basically. Instead of using a softmax, what if we consider a generic kernel function? Let's call this kernel function k. And the way kernel functions usually work, for those who don't know is you get as input uh, to So the change that's going to happen uh, from the transformer now is instead of having a matrix as input, we're not going to store activations anymore. We're going to maintain a fixed dimension uh, matrix and a vector. Let's call this matrix CT minus one and ST minus one. And this matrix and vector is going to be a fixed dimension, which means they're not going to depend on the size of the inputs that we are processing. And then the uh, then what's going to happen is it's going to work like an RNN. You get an input, and then you use uh, this new input to update to a new state. Yeah, so it's going to use this to update to a new state, and you generate a new representation. So internally, the way this thing works is uh, instead of calculating key queries values on the entire batch, you're not now going to use just the current input vector at a given time step t and apply uh, the weight matrices, the 
So then the difference here is going to be that we are not operating on the entire input uh, last history of inputs, but instead on just the current input. So it seems like it kind of solves the problem because now we don't really have to store the input. It's going to operate on a fixed site state and uh, it's an equivalent to self-attention. So probably it should be able to handle longer context as well, right? Because self-attention, we know there is so much evidence that it works well for long context. Maybe this would also work. Uh, and it only stores a hidden state. It's a fixed dimension. It's not going to uh, you know, like blow up if you process a really large input size. So seems like we have kind of solved the, can we just use this approach? Maybe we can just apply linear transformers and it would work. Uh, but seems like key challenges of applying linear transformers, namely to reinforcement learning, setting are these. The first challenge is the recurrent update. So I described, I showed that there was some recurrent update. I didn't really explain how it was working and you know why it works and why it's equivalent. But the problem with the recurrent update was that there was some matrix of uh, some dimension and you were adding new information to that matrix uh, without any sort of gating. Like you have uh, some previous matrix and then you add some new information to that matrix. Now, if you think about it, it's a problem, right? Because if the number of type steps keeps increasing, you're going to keep adding stuff to a matrix and it's eventually going to either, either of those two parties simulate square, it can become really small or it can become really large. And also we said like we have uh, something called this phi. Uh, the kernel function has this underlying feature map called phi. And we didn't really describe what this phi, uh, feature map phi is. We said that it's arbitrary. So it turns out people have done some experiments in the linear, with the linear transform approach and they have found that it's actually kind of a big deal because this exact specification of uh, uh, phi really affects the performance that you're going to get out of these approaches. And the third thing is, it maintains a matrix as a recurrent state. So if you, uh, for those who have worked with recurrent neural networks, you have a vector, fixed size vector as a, rec a recurrent state. But over here, we are saying that we are maintaining a matrix as a recurrent state. This is kind of a problem because in transformers, you have multiple layers and you have multiple self-attention heads. And uh, yeah, if you want to scale things, you want to probably have uh, a lot of these layers and a lot of these heads. And it's going to become computationally expensive if you're storing matrix for each of these uh, self-attention heads. So we're going to uh, solve this with, the, with our two approaches. The first approach is going to propose two contributions, which are going to solve problem one and two. Uh, the first contribution is to have a gating mechanism. So we, are, we said that we are adding information natively to the past. Uh, let's use a gating mechanism, a common approach, which people have used in the RNN literature. And the second is we introduce uh, our custom feature map. Let's try a new feature map that we came up with. And the third contribution is going to be an approximation of the first approach. So we're going to uh, improve upon the computational complexity of the first approach. So the first challenge was adding positive values to the recurrent state. So let's look at it now again. So uh, I'm just going to focus on this specific operation where we were adding new information uh, to the previous recurrent state. And this was just navely added. So we're going to do something really simple. And this is very common in the RNN literature. We're going to use a gating mechanism. And the way this is going to work is we're going to introduce some new parameters, uh, which is going to be calculated as a function of the inputs. And we are going to calculate gating vectors. These gating vectors are going to, uh, are going to use the sigmoid function. It's going to be calculated using the sigmoid function so that they have output between 0 and 1. And these are going to decide how much amount of information about the past you want to keep and how much new information you're going to add. And we apply this naively. We just say that it's an exponential moving average of the past. The new information that you get in is like an exponential moving average. And the second uh, challenge was that a feature map uh, needs to be specified. And this was when we are calculating the keys and queries. Uh, so for this, specifically, we are saying that we are applying this feature map called phi. But we didn't really specify what this feature map is. And we're going to think about what really we want out of this feature map. And previous approaches have studied that this feature map specifically serves two purpose, purposes. Uh, first thing that the feature map should do is, it should be able to non-linearly transform the uh, input vector. Uh, and the second utility that we want out of this feature map is, we want to 
project the input vector to higher dimensions. So we want to increase the dimensionality of the input vector, and we want some sort of a nonlinearity. These are the two things we care about in a feature vector. And what a previous approach has done is they use very simple functions, like element-wise functions like ReLU or ELU. Uh, and the problem with this function is they meet the first criteria. They're going to nonlinear transform the input. Uh, but they're not really helping you, you know, project the input data into higher dimensions. And there's also approaches called, uh, there are approaches which use random features. These approaches uh, kind of satisfy both the properties. They will be able to nonlinearly transform things. And also because uh, they will use a random vector to project the input to a higher dimension. But the problem with this approach is the element-wise approaches, I described the problem, but the problem with the random-wise one is it's going to uh, add a lot of variance. And that's going to limit the memory capacity that you have in these approaches. So it seems like a good idea to use random feature, but it didn't really work well in the practice in the literature. So what we will then try to do is, let's try to come up with a, we're going to introduce a deterministic approach uh, to deal with this problem. And the way we did this is, we, again, we are going to introduce some new parameters. Uh, and these parameters, uh, we're going to call it uh, WP1, WP2, WP3. And these parameters, the size of these parameters is going to be D cross eta. So eta is a new hyperparameter that we're introducing that's going to control the size of uh, you know, like how much you want to increase the input dimension to. So it's, it's going to control uh, uh, the projection dimension, we're going to call it. It's going to control, given an input vector, how much you want to increase it to. So it, let's say it's 2. That means it's going to increase the input vector to size 2, uh, two times. And then what we're going to do is, you're going to modify the way we calculate the query and key. Earlier, it was just a simple operation. You multiply it with weights, and then you uh, apply the feature map. Uh, but now what we are saying is we're going to use an outer product. And the key, uh, the, the uh, intuition behind this is you take the input, you apply uh, WQ, which was your regular way of calculating the, uh, the queries, uh, and then you apply ReLU, so you get, get an input vector. Now you want to project the input vector so it's some higher dimension. And the way we implemented that is using an outer product operation. So I don't, I have some input vector. I want to project it to some higher dimension. Uh, let's say I use the same input vector to calculate another small vector. Let's say it's of two dimension, right? Uh, and we are going to call this A. So if I calculate an outer product of this vector B, which is of uh, D dimension, uh, the, uh, the query of D dimension, and then another uh, vector, projection vector of two dimension, it's going to give you a matrix of size D cross two, right? And then if you flatten that matrix, it's going to be two times uh, D is going to be the size. So then the intuition is that you know you can increase eta and you can get a large vector uh, just by using outer products. And you're going to modify the key calculation also in the same way. Uh, and there are some changes required uh, to the way we do the gating uh, instead of uh, because now we are changing the dimension of the queries and keys. We also need to do the kind of the same thing with the gating mechanism as well. Uh, and so this approach is going to have these two contributions. The first is we have a gating mechanism, and the second is we have a feature map. So now it solves the first two problems. We still haven't talked about how computationally efficient this is. We, will go, we still have the other problem that we are using a matrix as a recurrent state. But let's see how well this approach performs compared to the gated transformer Excel approach that we saw in the previous uh, example. Uh, so we're going to train uh, this recurrent uh, linear transformer approach called RELIT. And we're going to set eta to 4, the projection dimension that I described. We're going to set that hyperparameter value to 4. And we'll also add two additional baselines just to have a sanity check, like, yes, RNNs don't perform well in this problem. So we're going to add GRU and LSTM. Uh, and our hypothesis is that RELIT will be able to perform close to that best Gated transform Excel, that agent that we had, but it will be much less computationally expensive than that uh, specific agent. And that is exactly what we observe. What we see is that I'm going to start with the recurrent baselines, the LSTM and GRU. What we're seeing is LSTM completely fail in this problem. They're like, they have a success rate around 0.5, which is literally like, you know, like it's just doing random actions at the intersection. And then we have GRU, which works quite well for until corridor length 180, and then the performance just drops. It's just not able to recall. And we did extensive hyperparameter tuning, believe me. Uh, 
and it's it would still be like this uh but seems like our approach is doing pretty well like even for the largest corridor length we are seeing that it's able to match the performance of uh, the gated transformer we get close to the performance of gated transformer excel i would say but how are we doing in terms of operations we are we actually have a lot of improvements per time step the amount of computation that we are doing we are seeing that our approach recurrent linear transformer using 40 times less operation than the gated transformer excel approach and it's also using 1.96 times less space so we seems to be we are not improving that much on space but we are improving a lot on computation and that comes brings us to the third uh, contribution we want to now in, in not store matrices as a recurrent state and we want to increase the uh, uh, you know like computational uh, efficiency also in terms of space so just to summarize yes uh, we are getting performance close to the gtr excel and then we have less computation complexity so we have a more efficient approach uh, than the uh, previous baseline. Uh, so th this brings us to the third challenge. And, and the problem was that everything that was done, uh, every update that was made in the recurrent linear transformer was to matrices. Like you have a previous matrix, a recurrent uh, state, a previous recurrent state, and then you use uh, some uh, new data that you, you use the new data that is coming in, the new input vector comes in, and you use that to calculate some vectors, and you add that value to the matrix so the, all the operations are being done on matrices and that's kind of uh, a challenge and so what we try to do is we try to come up with an approximation so instead of uh, and and the reason this is going to become a problem is because the transform architecture is going to contain multiple of these heads and for each of these heads you're going to maintain a matrix and it's going to blow up if you have like you know even this like the simple transform architectures they will have like the first transform architecture had like eight heads in each of the layer and they had like eight layers. So eight times eight, 64 matrices you will have to store. It's gonna become really computationally expensive and even like the, the GPT-4 and all, they have like a lot of uh, heads and layers. So it's gonna become really computationally expensive if you were to store matrices. So our approach to deal with this problem was to come up with a, our own way of approximating this matrix. And this, this was based on, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how this approximation works, but the idea was that it was derived using a trigonometric representation of a Kronecker delta function, briefly. Um, we used some sort of an approximation of a Kronecker delta function, and we came up with an approximation that allows us to uh, have a low rank uh, estimation of a matrix. And that is what changed. So original recurrent update had all the, uh, original recurrent update had all the operations described on matrices. And instead of that, what we proposed was an approximation. We are going to call this C tilde T. And this approximation is now going to be defined instead on, a ve on vectors. And the way we are calculating these vectors, we're going to have R vectors. Uh, so now R again is a hyperparameter, which is going to control the quality of the approximation. We're going to have R vectors. And the way we're going to calculate these R vectors is a function which only uses vectors. There is no operations done on matrices. And this, believe me, is going to be an approximation. I'm not going to go to, into the proof or the derivation of how this approximation works, but the idea is that you're going to have a hyperparameter R, which is going to control the degree of the approximation, and you're going to do all the operations on vectors instead of matrices. And so the input to the self-attention changes this way. Now we don't really have a matrix. We have uh, some vectors coming in as input, and you have uh, the input vector also coming in. And the number of input vectors is controlled by this hyperparameter R. So if you increase the hyperparameter R, you're gonna have a better quality approximation. If you, redu if you reduce it, the minimum possible value of R you could set is one. So if you put set it as one, that's the lowest quality approximation you could have. So the third, uh, sorry, the second approach is going to have all these three contributions. And we're gonna evaluate again what happens if we, uh, will be able to match the performance of uh, the non-approximate version with this approximation. And we're gonna train the worst possible approximation approach. Let's set R to one and eta to four. Uh, and we're gonna test what happens. And our hypothesis is that even with the worst possible approximation, this is gonna work really well. We're gonna get the same performance, we're gonna, but we're gonna see a lot of computational benefits. And turns out this is exactly what happens. See the red line here is the approximate version, the purple line is the non-approximate version, and it's performing as 
well as the non-approximate ver version. And in terms of computation, we now have a lot of savings, both in terms of uh, the amount of operations that we are doing and also the amount of space that we are using. So the final approach, the approximate recurrent linear transformer, uses 125 times less operations and 36.57 times less space. This is kind of cool, right? Because we have reduced the computational complexity by a huge amount, and we are still able to match the performance of like the state-of-the-art transformers. Uh, but, and just to summarize, the reason this, uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the computational complexity, but the reason this kind of works is because, uh, the reason we are able to reduce the computational complexity is because the computational complexity now no longer depends on the amount of input, the input vectors you're going to store, because you don't really need to store input vectors anymore. All you uh, all the computational complexity now depends on our fixed size hyperparameters. So how would it do it in a more realistic? This was like a very simple environment, right? So we can't really go with the, say that, yeah, this approach works really well. It's gonna work really well in all the kinds of settings. So how would it do in a more challenging setting? Let's consider uh, maybe like a pixel-based navigation task, maybe like a 2D maze uh, the agent has to navigate. And we're gonna consider this path uh, problem called the mystery path. And so this, this uh, figure here on the left is the agent's observation. This is what the agent is going to observe. And this is the ground truth. This is not what the agent observes. So this is the underlying ground truth. And this is the agent's observation. So what the agent has to do is, it has to travel through this mystery path denoted here by white, white color. And the agent does not, if you look at the observation, the agent does not really see the path. So it's invisible to the agent. Uh, so in each episode, what the agent does is, it tries to find a way to the goal, and if it falls off the path, what happens is it gets a feedback. So if you look at it, if it goes in a bad direction, if it is not in the path anymore, it gets a feedback, like a red color mark, which tells it, you know, it did a mistake. The episode does not end, but instead what happens is the agent is reset back to the start position. So the agent gets a feedback and it has to remember, okay, this is the region I fell down, and maybe this was another region where I fell down. It will keep on doing mistakes, and in, in a given episode, it has to figure out uh, you know, like these are the places where I can fall down and this is how I should go to the goal. So this is kind of a hard problem because you have to remember the exact, uh, you, the entire data that you get is going to be RGB pixels. So it's going to be 64 cross 64 encoded. And you have to uh, figure it out just from the pixels, you know, like, okay, uh, if I get, a, uh, you know, like the places where I fell down were important pieces of information that I need to remember. You have to do all of that from reward. And we tested our agents in this setting. Uh, and what we found is it actually does really well. Uh, so we tested on two uh, possible configurations of this environment. So we had a grid world version of this environment we, that is on the left side. And we had a harder version of this environment, which, was, uh, which featured more smoother movements and in larger grid size. And what we're seeing is that consistently in both of these environments, we were seeing that our approach here, RLIT, uh, is able to perform transformer approach uh, no matter the amount of context that you give. Like, for instance, in this, the first one, uh, in the grid world setting, we used a transformer approach, the blue line. Uh, it had the entire episode as history. And even then, our approach was able to perform really well and also, obviously, more computationally uh, uh, cheap as well. And uh, we saw the same thing in the harder setting as well, uh, uh, that it was in, both in terms of performance and both uh, in terms of computational efficiency, we are doing quite well. We also tested in another environment for the memory maze. This is even harder than uh, mystery path in the sense that now the agent sees a 3D observation. It's like in a 3D environment and the agent has to remember some pieces of information in that environment in order to get a reward. And even this, uh, in this environment, what we saw is our approach, even though it did not really defeat the transformer approach, it was able to match eventually the performance of the transformer approach, but we're doing much more, uh, we, are, we are much more computationally efficient, both in terms of GPU memory usage and also in terms of the number of overall frames per second uh, that you can process. <clears throat> 
So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, just to summarize, we presented a recurrent alternative to the self-attention mechanism. And this idea was based off of the linear transformer architecture. Our first approach was solving two of the key issues that were present in the linear transformer architecture. And uh, to solve these two issues, we proposed first a gating mechanism, which was allowing us to control the amount of information from the past that gets uh, deleted and the new information that gets added. And then we also proposed a feature map, which uh, allows us, uh, which is like an alternative. I wouldn't call it was like the major contribution, but it's like an alternative to an existing, to the existing feature maps, which people have used in the literature. And then finally, our second approach was improving upon the computational complexity of the first approach by introducing an approximation of the way the recurrent state is being calculated. Finally, we also showed that in a diagnostic problem like the T maze, we are able to uh, get the, X, the transformer, the gated transformer XL self attention would require the entire history, the entire episode as in its, uh, as passes, passed as input in order to do well. But our approach is able to match that performance by just using a recurrent state using an RNN. And it's also way more computationally efficient. Additionally, we also extended these results in a larger problem setting. Uh, we tried two environments, the mystery path and the memory maze. Lastly, I would like to thank my contributors and my, uh, my advisors for their help throughout this project without whose help it would not have been possible. Thank you so much. I think I can take questions. Yes, Marlos. Go back to increasing environment in the TM lab one. Yes. I know we don't have enough rats, but if you ran longer, would that rat take over the green one? Hopefully. I hope so. But the river is it does seem like that. Like uh, what what I found is like in usually in these memory based environments, it's kind of difficult. It it takes a lot of time to for the agents to converge to a solution where it would actually end up using its memory. Uh, for instance, in this problem, we, the number of steps that we are training on for this specific problem setting, it's actually very less compared to what people have done in the baseline. But the problem is it's really computationally expensive to train these approaches, uh, uh, in, in, given like we just have access to Compute Canada. So you could only train in for like reasonable number of steps and get like reasonable number of runs and you have to restrict the number of runs that we do. We could, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to bring it up here. This is where it starts? OK. So I guess the first question is, do you find this similar uh, do you find the similar performance for these four LSTM GRU year method with other RL algorithms? If not, uh, if not, in that case, maybe what you found in your experiments only because uh, of your chosen RL algorithm. Uh, so in the experiments done so far, we have only, uh, so we used two RL algorithms, I guess. Uh, well, actually, we used three RL algorithms. The first uh, experiment used A to C. Uh, the mystery path experiment used PPO. And the uh, memory maze experiments used uh, uh, asynchronous version of the PPO. So uh, I guess we have only tried policy gradient algorithms so far. But uh, yeah, I guess we have tried three algorithms so far, not, not, not just one. And uh, the second question is, I might be wrong. Uh, you have introduced so many new hyperparameters compared to the original method. If yes, how are you handling these many hyperparameters? Yes, we have uh, introduced uh, a lot of these hyperparameters. And uh, I guess the question might be like, what should I set the values of these hyperparameters? Because uh, in having a large, if, if it is like, I have to really set these hyperparameters to a large value to work in most realistic problems, then it's not going to have any computational benefit, right? But so far, what we found in the experiments is that it actually works decently for even the smallest possible values you could set these hyperparameters to. And in fact, we had an ablation of different values of uh, hyperparameter, uh, like, the, like for instance, the approximation hyperparameter, we found that increasing it did not really have a lot of impact uh, in the 
so far the settings that we tested. And the third question is, did you compare your method, uh, did you compare the, with the method which combines LSTM and uh, attention idea? I'm not entirely sure uh, which method you're talking about. Maybe if you can send me like uh, the link to the paper or something, that would really help. Um, the last question I believe is from Robert. Have you tried larger values of R in approximation? Yes, we did try larger values. Uh, like I said, we had an ablation and we found that it didn't really impact the performance much. We could just set it to one, it worked fine for all the problems that we tested. Yes. Right. Right. So the I guess the like it's because where we are applying the approximation, I would say, uh, like there are uh, you know like if you were to apply the approximation in the gradients, then you don't really have anything. You, you can't really do anything about it. The gradients are going to be really bad. But what we did here is we applied the approximation in the activation space. So we're literally modifying the way you calculate the activations. And that's giving the chance for the neural network to really learn a set of weights, which maybe works well in this approximate setting. Maybe that is why we are seeing these improvements because uh, you, know, you, you have le learnable parameters which you can modify and uh, you know, fine tune based on the data for a given approximation hyperparameter. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, do you mean like, so you do a time uh, thing, which is called a convolution, uh, and then you do a feature wise, which is, happens in the FFC layer, the feed forward layer that you have after the self attention layers. Right. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a recurrence part. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Right, but it doesn't really happen in a recurrent fashion uh, because you have the entire input available and you operate it on the entire input. Right. Right, right. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess that's what we tried to show in our experiments that uh, even though if we don't really store the entire inputs, I guess uh, the transformer approaches work really well because you have the entire input available. So you can just look back in the past and say like, oh, this input vector was important. But what we found is, at least for the experiments that we did, is this specific form of doing a recurrent neural network works really well. I'm not saying this is the way to go about it, but just from the experiments, what we are seeing is if we do recurrence this way, this sort of an approximation works really well. Uh, so it's merely like a, you know, like a proof of concept kind of thing that recurrent approaches might still not be dead. We might, we can maybe still explore recurrent approaches and they might still work. Yeah. Right. I would say, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I would say we kind of gave up really fast on RNNs. We did, like there are a lot of new approaches coming up. Like there, for instance, there's this approach called RWKV that literally came out when I was writing this paper. And that showed like we can actually, you know, like use recurrent neural networks and handle really long context. So the problem of long context, I don't think it has to do with uh, like you can probably use RNNs also. It just has to be a very different RNN from LSTMs and get it recurrent to us. Just need a more smarter way of handling the data is I believe like what might the problem be.